Next on the agenda, we have Mr. Rob Curtins yes. from Microsoft to give Microsoft's perspective on the future of higher, the future of technology in higher education. So we'd like to welcome Rob Curtins in charge of the Ameri uh, higher education for the Americas at Microsoft. Welcome. Thanks, Darren. So how many of you can read my slide? And what does it say? It says greetings. Greetings. In what language? Yes. So, so my name is Rob, and I thought it would be fun for me and all of us to actually do my presentation in Hungarian. Um, that would, A, be wonderful and inclusive for the guest that's often left out here in the States. Um, and two, it would test and have fun for you how well I actually know this content. Whether or not I need, if we get switched, I can switch it over. So um, one of the things I did want to sort of point out is that the slides that I was pulling together, and um, as you can imagine, I have no shortage of slides, and I hope to not go through them in a sequential order. Uh, I would love this, and I want to thank Brian um, I was tired for taking of most of the upfront slides that I had. You're always preparing um, kids for this world. And saying like, hey, really the world is changing. Anymore. Things are different. We need to think differently. Yeah, and we collectively like just sort of call that digital to transformation. To the point where they could actually build um, the future. Something's playing on one of my... Yeah, yeah. I think I know what it might be. It's this one. Um, we'll come back to that in a little bit. You pause. That's his Tinder face. Um, <laughs> so who knows what that is? Because you can't read. Only one person can read. Who knows what this is? What does it say? Well, it says the name of the city at the end. It's the coronation of Pope Benedict. In 2005, and this is eight years later, same scene, Pope Francis. How many people have seen this picture before? This is not a new thing. Brian, I'm, I'm not surprised that you've seen it. I like to go to it because it tells a very strong story, right? It tells a story and it asks a question that I think is far more important. The story's kind of self-explanatory. The question, oh, I'm in the, I'm in the Hungarian version. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that, but there's actually one that I have where you'll see, and if you'll notice, all my slide notes were translated to Hungarian as well. I'll show you how I did that three minutes before we came, came on. Turns out that translation, as Brian pointed out, is now available for three cents a minute, um, and you can have it into any one of 45 languages within 12 seconds. Um, pretty easy. So when we think about inclusive, etc. <laughs> But that's the question that I think doesn't get asked about this picture. Who wants to answer it? What did they do? They sent it on Instagram. They posted it to Facebook. They posted it to Facebook. <coughs> right? Why? To prove they were there. Yeah. yeah. Right? So I'm going to steal a quote from a gentleman who's actually kind of a competitor of ours, but as a person, I like him a lot. Dr. Milla, Mark Milliron from Civitas Learning. He's got a sort of a proud history. Um, he doesn't know that I steal this quote from him because he smokes <coughs> a lot, but I give him the credit that he deserves. That the greatest use of technology is that which makes the human moments more precious. That's a fantastic phrase because so much of what we want to talk about is this stuff. And Brian, I'm so happy you put your slides in because one of my elements, the sight gag, was to be like, who thinks that this is the future of technology? Right? That this is asinine, right? This is the this is the new mixed reality headset from HP, the latest and greatest for mixing AR and VR, bringing it all together, and you know, you can make it fit your head. And for anyone that goes onto the site Jerry of the Day. How many people here ever go to Jerry of the Day? It's a fantastic Instagram post. Um, your kids may know it. It's for morons on ski slopes um, who tend to wear their goggles upside down. They don't get that the circle goes on the nose. And then they find them and post other fools around a ski scope slide. You look like Jerry wearing those goggles. It's not exactly a very it's not certainly an inclusive experience, it's not a collaborative experience. And so the next iteration of that moves to the hollow lens where the world is indeed in front of you. However, it's still not perfect. And, and I really want to take this conversation 
and, and, and move and address your questions on those human moments. The need to be connected to one another. The need to consume information from each other. The validity and shift in how we consume data, how we trust sources, who we trust. And at some level, this, this hyper-connectivity has also polarized us. Because the echo chamber of I only listen to people who say things I want to hear or people like me want to hear allows us to filter that out. But a lot of, I'm going to move through a lot of the things that Brian already said. The world has changed, right? The majority of students today are not the 18 to 22 year olds. I realize for your market, and I want to make sure that you're serving a segment of the global higher education population that has very explicit expectations, is at a very specific stage of life. But as you're serving professionals, adult learners through the law school, through the college of business, or those that seek more experiential um, things around campus, you've got to understand who you serve. But even if you're serving the traditional student, great phrase I stole from the USA Today, fidgetals. Fidgetals are people who do not differentiate between the physical and digital world. And anyone that's driven, and I joked with Laurie, um, not Laura, Laurie, that our, our kids are traveled to youth sports around, and anyone that has a child in the back seat of their car knows that they will sit with their friends in the car, using their phones, having conversations and exploring, and their social life is as physical and digital in real time, and their experience are blended with those next to them and those far away from them in real time. And so their expectations, and one of the things that I'm going to present, and there was a gentleman, I believe he may have left, who asked a leadership question, which I think is actually, if we start with the end in mind, for those that love the ability to go through, I don't intend to show you all these slides, but I did want it to support conversation. I, I put this together because this is the end. We can come back. But the question that I think, Daryl, you put to me and, and to the group, what are we doing next? Just like we have all this technology. The technology in itself is just stuff, right? What are we doing next with it? What are we doing? And I created these sort of categories. This is based on no intelligent methodology. And by the way, I went to Northeastern University, the car heart of colleges, right? It's kind of now cool. It was once a very working class school, and yet stockbrokers proudly wear Carhartt and drive F-150 Raptors. They're never going to race those trucks in Baja, but it looks cool. And it's a legitimate pickup truck that we know costs $80,000, and it can do amazing things that I'm going to simply go to whatever activity I do every day and work in, but I wear it and use it proudly. Northeastern, I joke, it's the Carhartt of colleges. It's now a cool brand, it's the F-150. But when we think about digital transformation and how everything that Brian talked about, intelligent services, very personalized expectations, the power of cloud computing to give a scale that was previously unimaginable, creates a set of challenges, frankly, around trust. Right? A set of challenges around, will you now have more data about me? And I have agreed, and all of us have agreed in the past week, to have most of the data that we would never agree to share with anyone else where we go, what we click on, how we search, where that is. If anyone has used Waze for directions, who's, who uses Waze for directions, right? You don't think those ads that know you stop at Dunkin' Donuts are, pers are, are personalized? You don't think the routes, they're not just randomly sponsored ads. It understands your movement patterns and says, this dude goes to Dunkin' Donuts, there's another one around the corner. It knows that I go to Panera all the time. Turns out Panera, super popular with girls sports teams. They go there. I'm in another country, says, hey, there's a Panera around the corner. Really smart, but really creepy. So that, that element of trust is, is really important. But your challenge, and what I'm gonna say is the summary of all that I do, and then time allowing, I'll go back to, to sort of what's important. There's really four things that you need to think about. I'm gonna go back to what's core to your brand. I will speak in general terms about the industry, particularly in the United States, but I'll, I'll speak to some global trends. But all of it is gonna come back to your brand. The first one is pathways. A lot of people like to talk about technology and I think you're gonna have an excellent presenter from Apple this afternoon who's going to be able to go in and talk about this experience. What's the role of technology in the classroom? I think there's a macro issue and you hinted at blockchain. We hinted at new pathways. 
I can tell you that I'm speaking with multiple community college systems right now. I'm speaking with very prestige brands, MIT and Berkeley with edX sort of came out early. How can we deliver affordable, accessible, quality education with recognizable credentials? And that last part is still TBD, right? So just because you know something doesn't mean you've been vetted properly. Doesn't mean you have the soft skills, the capabilities. So as we start to look at pathways, you'll hear lots of people talk about micro-credentialing, badging, early assessment, profiles, personalized learning. All of this is actually driven by what is the traditional model of education? How can and should it span lifelong learning from dual enrollment for high school and college? Can we extend AP and other things beyond if you get a five on the test, you get college credit after you're admitted? How do we make sure we put people? There's a lot of questions on what I will call pathways. And understanding how you snap into that, I don't have the answer for you. I have some fun facts that I'll tell you about. But understanding what credit you can give to adult learners, what life experience you want to offer, how you want to deliver an assessment, what type of instrumentation you can get around prior learning experience and competencies, that you could couple with a degree that says they have the soft skills. They can collaborate. And I'll show you a few examples of that. The second one is huge. Experiences. You cannot underestimate this. Half of your experiences will be what I call theater. Showing the world that you're innovative. This is kind of cool. Anything with propellers right now is totally cool. And if you can have that around the campus, show the theater, that's going to matter. And this is, um, I'm going to make a comment that is typically associated with Apple, but we experience the same problems. The acquisition of tablets, we did the first classroom computers for us in Tucson, and some argue over who was first, 1994. Every student got a laptop. Wake Forest in 1997 gave every incoming freshman a ThinkPad. Why? Does anyone know the answer to this? Because the US News and World Report ranking said that if your tuition was higher, you get ranked higher and you're perceived as more prestigious. They had to justify raising tuition on purpose to raise the profile of the institution. And buying everyone a ThinkPad and betting that into the price. Now it's still 1990X late. A guy by the name of Jay Dominic, who's now at Princeton, uh, the CIO at Princeton, was then at Wake Forest. Yes, I'm old enough to have been the person that worked with him back at that time. Right? So, Really interesting, what's the experience? Some of it is theater, and you need to absolutely recognize that. Daryl's gonna ask you for a massive screen on the wall in the visitor center when parents come in. He's gonna ask you for stuff that seems superfluous. But if you're still a tuition-driven school and yield matters, some of that theater matters too. Just like pretty green grass does. And so there's parts of it that I don't want to undermine. But they're not changing outcomes. They're not changing learning outcomes, job opportunities. What is, is that signals of quality. This one I can put into a simple two by two grid. Students, faculty, or st students institutional, not faculty, right? Students institutional, internal, external. That's it. Students internal is all about retention risk, progression, and what signals you can use to personalize an intervention <coughs> to help people succeed. Student external is nothing more than badging competencies and whether or not you want to support micro-credentials or something beyond them. They got a BA, what does that mean? I graduated from Roger Williams University with a BA or a BS, that means what? To the greater world, it means you've been filtered and you've made it through the filter process of someone who passed upper middle classes America test of do you have an undergraduate degree. When we start to look at institutional, collegescorecard.gov still matters. US News and World Report rankings still matter. Those are your external. But internal, you'll have a scorecard, you'll have performance elements. Those signals are changing, driven by real-time data. And we joke, student engagement, student performance. We could put cameras in this room that tell how many of you are paying attention to me. The very text kind of expensive, right? But where it's being used, New York City subways. We've been on this project, our name doesn't get associated with it, but the cloud-based video processing can scan the subways and within 10 minutes with a very good facial 
image, we can find the target. If they're on the subway, there's points, there's algorithms, we know where your nose and your face are, I can show you some fun stuff that, that is exposed. But we can do that. But those signals of understanding whether or not students pay attention to a teacher, understand what the click stream is and where they're going in a classroom, because I would not suggest you turn the internet off, because everyone that sits in a meeting today is doing email. You're doing it right now, I, I welcome it. You should snipe me. You've said X, I found Y, let's discuss that, right? But to tell a student, listen to me, I may be boring, but it's your responsibility, right? That's, you can get a signal, are they paying attention? And you couple that with outcomes, other mindset issues, those are real issues. Some of those signals are creepy. And there's an absolute issue, we did a lot of work with Arizona State. Um, there's other schools, Arizona State tends to be, ooh, you work with them on this? Um, they had a grant from the Mayo Clinic based on the assumption, really basic, healthy kids do better, sick kids don't. That includes mental health, right? We also know there's some real issues around mental health on campus regarding stress, ending in some very extreme events occasionally. No campus wants that. So there is a very good emotional, personal safety reason to actually mine the movement patterns, the lunch card data, of whether or not a student's engagement went from here to here. Do they go to the lunch card anymore? Are they moving around the Wi-Fi networks? But unless you put it through the lens of we only spot risk factors so that a counselor could make a call to find out if they're okay, any other use case is morally reprehensible. Like, what are you doing tracking me across? Who cares whether I eat or not? Are you really asking me if I had 3,000 calories today? And please, Brian. There's an interesting study last year from a uh, mental health clinic where they massively surveyed all of their patients and their activity over social media. And they're able to build a very good model that gave them about 90% certainty if a given person was going to self-harm or attempt suicide. And, uh, By looking at social media feeds. Yeah. So we'll walk through some of the technologies that make that real easy. Uh, in this case, it was mostly generic social media that they had some filtering on. Sentiment analysis built in? Yeah. 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 I mean, very basic analysis. Yeah. Um, and, but also drawing on a lot of their psychology, uh, the psychology uh, treatment and all records of that. And then using some basic uh, devices, not many mobile, but for lockdown desktops. Yeah. Um, but this is, the, this is the question if you have that power to literally save someone's life, in the case of Mayo Clinic, to intervene with the students, change a student's life at a radical level, would it be unethical not to use it? So, I'm going to give you the counter to that, and I want to encourage others, because my slides are less important. Your thinking is what's important. There's an old adage, or I shouldn't say old, there's a, there's a retail issue, that if you sweep your sidewalks, you're actually taking responsibility. You've therefore shown responsibility, and you're liable if they slip. If you don't sweep your sidewalks, that's a public way. You've shown no effort. You're not liable if they sleep, slip. Apply that to this issue. So the less care we show, the better we are. Yeah, from a risk standpoint. Yeah, yeah. From, which is, you know, well, it's, 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 best, it's best practice in Saudi Arabia in the litigation because that, and in a lawsuit, I'm going to do just that. Somebody's going to say, well, you, you said you could predict my kid's behavior, and Brian said, we always know what's going to happen, and it still failed. And now, but if we didn't do it at all, we could go, I don't know, it's just like, if you have to clean the ice off the sidewalk all the time, then they say, well, you're responsible for that, and I assume the ice would be cleared. Yeah. It wasn't, and I fell. Right. But if you said, we never clear the but ice. But now compare that to the article of three students killed themselves at RWU last year. This is, I don't know the answer here, guys, right? Like, these are the questions. Please, he, he wants to contribute. To build on that one, because that's, that's the day job lens for me. Yeah. You have advisor early warning and alert systems. You have right. meal card activity. You have if they're going and swiping into the gym or not. Yeah. So, you know, the very simplistic, I'm not a lawyer. What did we know and did we act on that information or not? is a higher ed systems perspective of mm -hmm. taking attendance in a class, how long did they, are they logging into Blackboard? There's implications about 
once you start tracking it, and you're not acting on it, you know, where does that line fall? So cuts across FERPA and HIPAA I, and all I, the things that we I do. think that has to be very insidious too. I, I did some installs at, at a large banking system where we were tracking the behavior of employees. I mean, not for any nefarious reason. It was just they were trying to track productivity and when people did things and why they did things and what their path through the building was. And when it got out, we were doing that, it immediately turned into this horrible, you know, oh, they're trying to, you know, track our every move, they're trying to find out what we're doing and what we're goofing on. Like, no, we're not. We were just we we're just trying to see if, you know, we should put more bathrooms on the third floor because people had to go upstairs to the bathroom. Yeah. And it's like and they're like, no, no, I don't want to be tracked. And you know, all these employees were you know refusing to carry their badges and all this stuff because they didn't want to be tracked. I think you get that with schools too, even when you have the good of it. If it gets out that you're doing it, and they say, well, they're tracking how many calories I ate, and you say, well, we're not doing that because we care what you eat. We're doing that to make sure you're eating. You know, and it's like, oh, yeah, I don't want to be tracked. I don't want to be tracked. Well, it's weird. Track. We like paternalism sometimes, and we don't like it. Other exactly. We like surveillance, and we don't like it sometimes. <laughs> Please. So uh, Brian asked me, I'm Tracy Smith, though. Uh, I'm the account executive for Microsoft. I think I know most of you. But Brian asked me, he said, so what's, um, what's the most popular product right now on Microsoft? What, what are people buying? Office, whatever. I said, actually, the, the most popular activity I'm doing right now is um, outcomes and analytics in Azure. So predictive, uh, predictive <coughs> analytics in Azure. Uh, a lot of them initially right now are around uh, you know, uh, requests from provosts around wanting to know graduation rates, tracking the student life cycle during their, you know, during their time at, at the university. But absolutely, the conversations lead into, well, well if, if, we, if we're easily doing this, what if we, I just had a conversation with Jehu about this, what if we you know, uh, uh, take their student cars and kind of track where they're going and, and you know, will help us manage, uh, you know, understand if there are any students at risk or anything like that. So it is, uh, it, it is absolutely a reality. Um, and, I, and I wanted to bring that point up because the conversations I have are very little, uh, not really about how's your office going, right? <laughs> it's, about, it's about what do you want, what do you, you know, what can we do to help you improve? So it, it's pretty interesting. So Daryl, this is one great point to take. At, you should look at all tools. Ours are really good. Um, but the, this is my last slide. It was gonna be a summary slide, but Brian did such a great job. I don't necessarily wanna go through all my stuff that just repeats a lot of the things that, that he said. Because I think these conversations are super important, including that last piece, which is the others can be handled as far as pathways, a combination of publicly available technology and your policies. Experiences are clearly something within your control, and we can dive into what sets the expectation for experiences. Signals are clearly within your control around what data sets do you have access to, what are the things that are important to you, and, and there's a whole other presentation we can go into around data, but there's really four stages to data. Most people are at stage two, right? First one is collection. There's an awful lot of sources that, frankly, we never had before. So student information systems, learning management systems began to really just collect data, right? And then the wave over the past 10 years was visualization. Whether it was in tabled, tabled reports or dynamic donut charts, it was all just visualization. It showed me stuff. Where we are today is prediction, right? And I'm sharing you the slide here, but it's, it's a prediction is okay. We've collected it, we've visualized it, but visualizing it is really for public, but prediction actually helps me, right? And the next is actually you get rid of all of it and it's just real-time guidance. So if we joke about Waze, Waze is one of the few, you probably heard the word big data, Waze is one of the few true big data applications that exist in the world. What I mean by big data, and this is exciting, there's four Vs, some argue there's a fifth, right? Volume, velocity, variety, and veracity, right? And there's not gonna be a test on this. And these are all the elements of where it's coming from, what it's like. Think about ways. Every single phone is generating GPS signals back in real time. It's filtering this. It's sending a mesh of data back to your phone. Why Waze burns the battery? Because good stuff's happening on your phone. Right? There's a power, and yes, I have an iPhone. There's a powerful machine, right? 
We had another device on the Windows phones that was kind of working. It wasn't as good as Waze, right? And, and, and Waze churns the bejesus out of your battery because it's taking that mesh of data, doing real-time processing. So we've distributed processing, we've got shared data, we've got multiple inputs, and it's telling you not, this is all the things I've done to mesh that data together from thousands of GPS points. It's just said, take a left, dude, right? Like, there's a police car up there and there's someone put in a lot of traffic. Get off the highway and skip this. That's guidance, right? And very few people have guidance. Now, what you'll see, I'll show like, Cortana, right, Siri does it too, it says, hey, you have a meeting in your calendar that has got this address on it, and you're an hour and 45 minutes away with traffic. So I actually shake your hip and tell you you might want to leave in the next 10 minutes without me setting that up, right? So that's guidance, right? It's happening in that consumer world, but understanding how we take this technology, the experiences we want to deliver, aligned to our brand. I want to understand that because community colleges are delivering very different experiences. Boot camps are delivering very different experiences. How you change culture, for, you, for everyone here that's a leader, and if you're here, you're a leader on campus, that's a really difficult process. And so we also have some resources around transformation frameworks. But just managing data, that's a conversation we can really dive into. How do you collect? How do you analyze? What are we doing to run predictions? And then how do you actually land it in a way that makes sense to an individual faculty member or student so it's non-intrusive? And it's not like putting on that goofy headset, I'm now going to the data part of my day, right? It's, oh, data just surfaces and, I, and I'm able to give reasonable guidance. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to drill into a few of those things. Um, what I, I, I do want to sort of show is, you know, we, we sort of started here that that's what students expect today. Um, you mentioned Clayton Christensen earlier. This quote is actually from four years ago, but at a Salesforce conference this October, it got resurrected and then reposted all over, right? So this was from his book with Henry Eyring, The Innovative Institution. Now, if you'll remember, he also wrote with Michael Horn a book called Disrupting Class carefully worded, right? The disruptive innovation theory was about disrupting class in K through 12, but for his home environment, well, we're not gonna disrupt higher ed, he chose the innovation word, the innovative university, when frankly, the disruptive innovation theory is as applicable to higher ed, if not more so, for all the reasons Brian pointed out regarding debt, access, equity, perception of quality, et cetera. But this was reposted in November 2017 all over the web, but it was actually from his book, The Innovative University. A core tenet of the disruptive innovation theory. How many people have read the book or are familiar with its core concepts? The, there's, two, there's a couple of basic tenets, and everyone talks about it. One, disruption's not an event, right? It's not like the day happens when disruption occurs. It's a very long process. Two, the people who were disrupted typically made very good decisions. This is the one that should scare you the most. In all the cases of disruption, the companies who were disrupted made good decisions for five, six, seven years because it was simply better, more profitable as where the market was to stay put. Microsoft is actually put up as an example of a company who was threatened to be disrupted. And I ran our US higher ed user group circa 2005 to 2007. And one of the corollaries with the people who made good decisions is that they listen to their best customers. It's the most dangerous thing in the world you could do. You listen to your best customers. And we gathered our best customers, CIOs from a wide mix, and they told us very clearly, your licensing is too complex. You don't scale and you're not secure. Not like we bit our fingernails, but we need better security for the inside. And in the next 10 years, we knocked those elements out of the park. We did exactly what our best customers told us to do in universities and corporate America. We made our stuff scalable. We made it easy to manage. We simplified our licensing. We made it so you just signed all people covered here, right? And six years later, everyone said, you missed search and music. <laughs> Not one of my best customers said, it's all about music, right? 
music. You missed the whole iPad thing. You mi no, we did what our best customers told us. And the answer was because something else happened on the other side. Those whose alternative was nothing. And that's like the third key element. Those whose alternative is nothing drive the disruptive innovation forward until it hops over. This should scare you because you have a wait list every year. You fall into the bucket of no, no business with a wait list ever went out of business, right? You come in, but yet in the past 10 years, we've seen a doubling in the global higher ed population and absorbed 350 million extra people. Facilities online, growth in China, India, Latin America. We were able to absorb that within the existing infrastructure. The next 15 years is going to double again to 1.4 billion. We are not going to put 750 million people in the same buildings, classrooms, and campuses. There's no capacity. Their alternative is what? So what happens when your alternative is nothing, right? The workforce on the other side says, this is where people go to school, and this is, so here, these are the jobs that I want, these are the jobs that I'm hiring for, and here's who's in them. I need to hire people, and they're not coming out. My alternative as an employer is near nothing, right? All those squares that I want to hire for by 20, 25 are filled by this number of people in the pipeline. My alternative is nothing. So what's happened? Alternatives come up. Lynda.com, heck, edX. We're filling a massive gap in workforce preparedness, not just for basic skills, high pay jobs like cyber, data science. Microsoft has offered what we call a Microsoft professional program. Because we're a really good company, we want to make sure the world has the ability to grow and connect. Those are all fundamentally true of our CEO. But we also offer a data science program because if our shareholders don't see enough qualified people who can do data science, we won't churn the Azure cycles and drive the adoption that we need to drive to make our company successful. So we invest in education because there's a gap. There's a gap that doesn't allow four years plus two years plus a PhD to kick out a data scientist. Scary stat, in Seattle alone, Boeing and Microsoft, think Amazon, Google are also there. We will hire every data scientist at just two of the companies that I managed. Every data scientist that you can do in the entire west coast of the United States. Draw a line at the Mississippi, and at current rates, we could take all of them and put them in Seattle and they would have a job. Boeing, Amazon, and Microsoft. Our alternative is nothing. We've got to find something. So alternatives pop up. These alternatives all of a sudden start to look interesting. And then there's the other end of the spectrum, right? Those are very, what I'll call, vocational. Even if that vocation is a high paid job, those alternatives are vocational. The other end of the spectrum is experiential. Deep immersion. Minerva is a new alternative. Who knows what their admission selectivity rating was last year? Stats from the College Board. Minerva Schools. They were third in the world. Super low, but they were third. That means of the Ivy Leagues, five were behind them. Right? More selective than Stanford. More selective than Duke. Is anyone familiar with what they do? Tell us. Yeah, well, my son was on their recruiting email list, so I saw and how they bring you into recruit students is fascinating. Um, but high level um, multi campus experience and students will rotate across what San cities? Francisco to Cairo to Beirut to Africa, and it's a complete transitory curriculum. Students will move and blend across. The ultimate global experience. You offer a campus abroad for a semester, yeah. they offer the globe as your campus. Right? Now, to be fair, one of the reasons their selectivity rating is so high is their global admissions pull is massive. So while I speak with the, you should be very afraid of face, 
The reality is the number of US students that are applying is still super low. They're getting students from India, Chile, right, Brazil. They're getting students from around the world that are driving their admission numbers super, super high. So they get a selectivity rating. But if you start to look at who they're going against and what's happening at all these other institutions that are taking some of the world's most prestigious brands, not just in higher ed, the world's most prestigious brands, period, and are putting their name on access alternatives and are investing heavily in infrastructure for proper assessment or delivery of learning, you're actually seeing, well, you mean I can get edX-like education coupled with this brand and then they'll offer me a new alternative? And so here, here's where you start to see some dangerous things. And, and, and I'm gonna put something forward that some people, and I want the conversation. That until we realize higher education has become a consumer marketplace, we like to talk about it as a public good, it's different, and that historically there's some data that, that we'll share. If you acknowledge that higher education is a personally funded, family financed, relatively commoditized choice where the consumer right, has that option, you're a consumer business. No different than stacking restaurants. Some restaurants have convenience food, some restaurants are highly experiential. It's rarely about the food. It's about the experience. Do I want in and out basically healthy stuff? Yeah. Or do I want an immersive Minerva campus-based experience? And if you understand where you're living kind of in the middle, are you a convenience-based brand, prestige-based brand, or an experience-based brand? Those are all things that are critical to how you position yourself. And so when we think about industries that have been transformed, <coughs> the railroad industry at one time had 250,000 miles of railroad. And if anyone's ever watched Hell on Wheels on Netflix, I highly recommend it. Um, it's basically a soap opera set against historical fiction of, I'm sorry, historically accurate drama of uh, pushing the railroad from New York to San Francisco. The vision of the time, Christmas in New York, New Year's in San Francisco. Right? That was 100 years ago. 100 years ago, our vision was that a vision was that you could have Christmas in New York and seven days have New Year's in San Francisco. How many people this week were on the West Coast? That was, right? I was home for breakfast. I took a red eye. I'm home for breakfast. I actually work out of the West Coast. Like, that vision has long since blown up. But the interesting thing is, it's been cut in half. The railroad business has been cut in half. And there's a great essay around in, in industry myopia. They define themselves as being in the railroad business. And it's a great lesson learned. What if they define themselves as being in what business? Transportation, Transportation business, right? That's why Ford is investing in driverless cars. That's why you'll see all these companies that are redefining themselves is we don't we're not an auto manufacturer we're a personal transportation company we're core to your identity anyone that's driven well even around here right you see the guy that you know he's on the chevy or the ford logo like chevy and ford is a big fight that's core to your identity what business are you in this is a super important question for you to answer as you think about investments on campus. Are you in the business of relationships, the business of learning, the business of experiences? All of us at some level are in the business of learning. You may wrap that learning with a great network or campus experiences with wonderful athletic facilities that students love to gather around and continue both their athletic and academic pursuits. Those are important things. But what I, fo what I submit, and Brian, I'd love your thought, anyone else's thought, is that one of the greatest challenges that we'll face over the next 10 years culturally is the prioritization of the shift to student-centered focus. You are in the business of learning. With all offense intended, most of the people working here think you're in the business of teaching. I won't read all of these to you, right? But I will bring up an interesting picture that I think uh, we can skip forward and then I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this, right? Let me do this. 
This is HBX, Harvard Business School. This is the epitome of an institution that still thinks it's in the business of teaching, right? Is that Hollywood Squares profile? That great an experience for that student, right? Like, I'm a student. If that were not Harvard, I would walk away. They're in the business of relationships. They're in the business of prestige. And I would argue, having met with the admissions director, he's flat out, and this is not the current one, I sell class. It's a pretty good product to sell. And everything you do when you attend, you get that little bag that you see on planes, you know, Harvard Business School. It's, I sell class. You gotta make it through. But for the rest of your life, you're a Harvard Business School grad. But that experience is not the future of education. That is a faculty-centric, I'm the rock star, everyone look at me, horrific experience for students, quite frankly. And so what I want to talk about, and then we can cut for, for, for time. I could obviously keep on going. But as you think about it, I love this because Apple's in the room. The greatest innovation of the iPod, right? often associated with the digital transformation of the music business, had absolutely nothing to do with the iPod. Hold on for a minute. <coughs> Who here ever had a Sony Walkman? I know you did, right? <laughs> it was the 80s, we talked about playlists, right? Think about the friction involved in creating a playlist. That was a true labor of love, right? And you gave it to your girlfriend, like, I made you a playlist, <laughs> right? And she put that cassette tape in. It was hard. And what did you have to own to create the playlist? Albums, right? He bought the whole album, the whole thing, right? And if I really wanted to play that song, you know, the one that works for me, I had to have it, right? It's a lot of friction. What did Apple do that was brilliant? It wasn't portable music. We had portable music. It was just a horrible experience. There was a wonderful New York Times article about eight years ago that said, look, Steve Jobs is not an innovator. He's a tinkerer. He's the world's best tinkerer. He takes existing technologies and makes them perfect. It was this really long article. It makes sense. He didn't invent anything. Just, you know, Windows came from Park, digital music already existed. He said, this experience stinks. And what did iTunes do? I get whatever song I want pretty much on demand, right? It unbundled the album. It gave me music on demand. And for people who are unwilling to pay, if I actually need that song right now, heck, I'll pay 99 cents, right? I'll buy this song right now for 99 cents. That was huge. And I got it through a common store. And yeah, it ran on Windows, because that's what most people had then. And that actually switched people, because they got into iTunes, and now their stuff moved with them. Their equity moved with them. You might think, what does this have to do with education? And the answer is, what was the stickiest part of iTunes? Song equity. What's the stickiest part of education? Curriculum equity. So when you figure out how to unbundle the album from the song, or the degree from the competency, and you make that competency sticky, you're now my iTunes for life. And let me buy other stuff, and we'll talk about how that works. But what Apple did through iTunes is revolutionize content acquisition, distribution, and while they blew up record stores, this is really important, Apple disrupted the record store business. They did not disrupt the music industry. Just like newspapers are in a tough place right now, right? News isn't in a tough place. Newspapers are in a tough place. If you define yourself by your method of delivery, you're in trouble. Because your method of delivery is no different than Virgin Records and the Boston Globe. But if you define yourself as being in the news business, the music business, or the learning business, now let's look at experiences. The very same people who are reluctant to pay 99 cents 
will happily pay $299 to be at that concert. That concert lasts three hours. Experiences matter. I am not suggesting that this gathering of humans, where it's been said you can smell the pheromones, right? It matters. Bringing humans together, the music industry used to be concerts drove CD sales. Now it's the other way around. They drop music for virtually nothing. The album's going to drop. And they drive experiences. And people pay a premium for those experiences. So I want to be clear, I am very bullish about the opportunity in front of Roger Williams University. You offer a wonderful experience, just look around, right? But you've got to be super clear around your value prop, who you serve, what type of experience is targeted to which user, and clearly define whether or not you are student ready. Barack Obama, in the beginning of his term, put big, initiatives around gainful employment, striking down the for-profits, and had a major agenda item for college ready. It was 10 years ago. The college ready agenda, while it didn't hit his goals of 60%, kind of worked. The challenge we face today is whether or not you're student ready, not the other way around. And I'll, I'll sort of move through. This was a slide I put together in 2011. Quite honestly, put this together in 2011 is that if you look at what the Obama administration's doing, they're basically taking everything that's associated with consumer protection. And they're looking at higher education as a consumer market. And they're saying gainful employment, mandatory reporting, and we joked, this is a nutrition label for higher ed. And then in the not too distant future, you're gonna see a nutrition label for higher ed, including warnings. Enrollment in a fashion program at this institution is likely to get you a job at the Gap that will not pay for your debt. Then you look at the collegescorecard.gov and it does exactly that. It was a joke. But when you, anyone have a son or a daughter who's had to sign a FAFSA? When you sign the FAFSA, it actually sends you to this site and makes you acknowledge that you read all the data on the university. It makes you acknowledge you read the average indebtedness. It makes you read that you, you looked at this. Now most people like terms of service, click through and say, I just want my financial aid. But the Department of Education now has a nutrition label for every school out there. And like most nutrition labels, I just want Twinkies. I don't really read them in detail. But for those that are health conscious, they read it. And for those that are increasingly becoming aware, they read it, right? So I joke, this is a thing. Look at the amount of money these schools are spending on pools. He's quite handsome, gets your attention. But it drives the point home. They know what business they're in. Research and experience. 52 million at Auburn, look at that pool. There's not a lane line on it. That has nothing to do with NCAA athletics. The one at Missouri, kinda, because on the other side is the, right? This is student experience. If you've ever been to Lubbock, you need a pool. Like, you gotta have one. So, you're gonna go to West Texas, you need a pool. Edge Adventures actually did real research. Went through what are the different profiles, right? You can just subscribe to the Edge Adventures research. But as we start to think about how technology is gonna impact learning, I'll kind of leave you on this and, and we'll get back to, to lunch. <laughs> this is typically my title slide. But I would say it's swipe right on learning. Recognize that higher ed is showing increasingly the attributes of a consumer marketplace. And therefore, the expectations and the experiences from that consumer marketplace are setting learner and student expectations for engagement. I can use Bank of America to transfer funds. I can PayPal $30. This is very secure stuff. I can turn my card off. I have a bunch of access through that app, right? But my consumer experience, I joke about swipe right. Guess what Handshake's doing? Anyone familiar with Handshake? It's the college recruiting tool for students. You swipe right on jobs now. They use your interface and students flip through on their mobile phone like nope, nope, yep, yep, yep. Why? Because it works. The consumer experience, and my argument is here, swipe right on learning. The 
things you should be thinking about are consumer experiences set student and adult learner expectations. You are increasingly in a consumer market. And jokingly, the swipe right, and I know none of you have ever used Tinder, but swipe right means I like you, right? So I like learning. Shift your focus away from what you teach and how you teach it to what students learn and how you prove it. How you prove it is a really important piece, and it gets back to those signals parts. So um, for those that want to say, well, give me some examples of people that are doing it. I have a whole joke around Domino's Pizza actually is the example of what someone's done to use data to their advantage. And then there's actually a group here at the Temple School of Business, and I'll, I'll close with this. Four. That's why the Fox School of Business created Roadmap. It's not a report card. It's more powerful, more dynamic, and more importantly, interactive. Roadmap helps you visualize your progress as you pursue your Fox MBA. You'll be able to review feedback from faculty, industry executives, and your peers on course deliverables. Then you'll measure your development of key business competencies, such as business reasoning, financial acuity, or leadership. This will help you identify any gaps in your skills, so you can chart your progress over time. You can even get a closer look at... So what I think, this is their advertising out on YouTube. It's called Roadmap. Now, you can't just go buy it and use it, even though they're trying to sell it, because it's fundamentally based on two things most schools don't have. One, an agreed-upon competency map that they worked. Their benefit in this case was that the employers that take Temple MBAs typically are within 50 miles of Temple itself. Right? They're either professional learners, career switchers, and, um, or career ad advancers. So they could get a group of 12 employers and effectively cover 60 to 70% of the destinations. Right? They then created a full competency map. Simultaneously, they were going through and redoing all of their curriculum. They used our tools in the, for those that have propellers on their head, they used SQL analysis services and integration services to put it into a data lake and expose it via Power BI and then run it through a student engagement platform so that students can now see in real time the lift that I've received. And it was the director of enrollment management who actually drove the project. Why? Because she said, how do they answer the Business Week survey? What value did you get from your education? Let's get back to how do you prove it. The question was, what are the students going to say? Will they graduate from Temple? They're going to be asked the question for Business Week, did you get value? What are they going to say? And they realized they don't know. And if they didn't know, then how could they control what the students say? So they put roadmap in to tell them, OK, your competency level was here when you came in. And all the competencies are mapped across seven key areas. Every activity in the classroom Every exercise, every group project is mapped. So you end up seeing that I have 1,388 data points, assignments, group projects, peer review, employer. And the students look and say, wow, I have this many data points that tell me on these competencies I'm here or here. And I'm progressing to here. And so when I graduate, I look back and say, Temple brought me from a 2 to a 4. Now, I've told them to change their scale from 1 to 4 because their mindset was GPA to 1 to 10, to a lot, because no one really wants to be a 2.8. Like, ooh, I went for 2.7. I go, make it 1 to 10. Go look at Delta. Like, give me a bonus for becoming silver, right? Even though I'm a long way from platinum, if you go to Delta right now, they'll tell you, you're only two flights from silver, right? They don't say, you're still 88 flights from platinum, right? So, oh, good, I'll get two more flights and I'll be silver, right? So they have a long way to go in taking consumer expectations around competencies. But the students this spring will be the first students who are walking into job interviews with the jobs classified against the same competencies. And they'll be sitting down with the confidence that during the past two years, I either came in with or grew in the following areas. And the job you're trying to fill is seeking these areas. It's a pizza tracker for MBAs. And if you think about why Uber works, it's not because cabs are smelly. They are. But we could put up with it. Why does Uber work? Who wants to guess? Anxiety. That's it. Is the cab going to be here? Do they take credit cards? Are you taking me for a ride? Will I get a receipt? Will I be able to expense it? Uber solves all those problems. It's exactly five minutes away. It will be $37 before I hit yes. Right? I get in the car. I see my route. Sends me an email. 
with the root. I submit expenses. Bulletproof. That's why it's better than a taxi. In fact, there are times, and I was in San Francisco last week, where Uber was eight minutes and there were a line of taxis right there. Right there. I took Uber. Why? Because it would go right to my credit card. I go to expense it straight away. And if anyone says, dude, that's like the third taxi you took in a day. You're, you're like jamming your expenses up. I'm like, well, it was from here to here, here to here, here to here. That's why I use Uber. Anxiety. No anxiety. And if you look at all other technologies, Domino's Pizza is doing the same thing. When's the pizza guy going to get here? Please. I can't answer that last question, but um, <laughs> uh, Tracy uh, Cobbler has this wonderful book on for-profit schools. And one of the key findings she had was that the for-profits completely triumphed over everybody else in higher ed in onboarding students. So the admissions process, the recruitment process, the financial process was insanely smooth compared to anything we would do. Um, that's not to say for profits were at times predatory and horrible. She was just looking at that one particular point, and that was one where who's the article? Uh, it's a book okay. uh, on for profits, uh, and the author is Cotton, Tressie Cotton, uh, and it's a fantastic book uh, called Lower Ed. And uh, I mean, she's teach, she's working for profits, and is now a sociologist at a different university. Um, but just as an example of, of how powerful that can be. That Uberization of that one process. Yeah. The for profit enrollment bloomed from 1990 to 2005. Yeah, so there's, um, there's unmet need, the innovator's <coughs> dilemma. For profits entered, right? And it, anyone ever used a remote control on their TV, right? Remember? And some of us were here when that was cool, right? Could you ever go back, right? So, the for profits, while they have stink all over them, deservedly, were serving an unmet need in the marketplace for a whole population of learners who were given a set of experiences that were the equivalent of a remote control. And they're not going back. They're not going back to term based billing. They're not going back to, well, you can start in October, right? They're not going back to, I don't care, I'm going to bill you on the first day and you figure out how to bridge an $18,000 gap. Like, they're not going back. The for profits changed learner expectations. Their brand stinks, your brand's pretty good. But if you want to capitalize on that market, you better act like they did. And the conversations we're having with community colleges, particularly right now, is every single one of you has a little system at every campus. You fight about budget and performance based funding, and accreditation is held at the campus level. There's a major workforce need for reskills, and you don't have one system at the system office that actually captures students, gives them a quick assessment, directs them to a campus, and uses your campuses as outlets, you let campuses fight against each other, and you have no insight into the economy. What would a for-profit do? They would say, we have one system for the system, we have 27 outposts for delivery, we have the following majors, and we'll sign you up and give you credits and equity just like iTunes while you're in high school. We'll let you build a profile while you're at work, and then we'll mine that and connect you with all the offerings that we have across our outlets, whether they're online or next to you, or if you travel, you're in Mobile and you want to be in Birmingham on Thursday, take a course there. That's what the for-profits would do. And there's a bunch of community colleges having that conversation today which is that my traditional campus-based systems don't support the model of engagement that the very students you just point out now demand. And so as you think about technology investments, it's not just about the lights and the cool stuff in the room and the headgear. It's actually the data systems to engage the students the way they expect to be engaged today. I know I've gone over, and I know it's lunchtime. If anyone wants to see more, yes, I can show our stuff, right? But I, I just want to say thank you for giving me your time, and I appreciate the, the effort you're making to think about the future. Thank you.